All right, welcome back, everyone. So we've been talking about systems of differential equations and how you can simulate them by looking at their uh, eigenvalues and eigenvectors, how you can understand their behavior. So we've seen that systems with uh, stable eigenvalues that have a negative real part, um, then the system x in time will be decaying, kind of a decaying exponential function. This is you know e to a minus lambda t. We've also seen uh, that if we have a, a positive or unstable eigenvalue, we will get um, kind of this unstable exponential growth of x in t. This is an e to the positive lambda t, okay? And there is a third case that I'm going to show you today, and this is super duper important uh, for a lot of problems like turbulence and things like that, that looks a little bit different than this. So it's somewhere between these two. And the case I'm gonna show you today, the state of the system initially grows large, very, very large. It looks like an unstable system, but then it turns around and eventually decays. So there is a really interesting class of systems of differential equations, um, x dot equals ax, where the eigenvalues and eigenvectors of this A matrix give rise to this very peculiar behavior where you get this um, kind of initial, this is called a transient energy growth, transient energy growth, energy growth. And then finally, uh, after this transient energy growth, eventually you get a stable decay, a stable decay. So these systems, these A matrices, will have stable eigenvalues, eigenvalues with a negative real part, but through some uh, interesting mechanism that I'll tell you about today, they have this initial rise of the state. The state actually leaves the origin, it goes away from x equals zero, it climbs, and then eventually it slowly decays back. So it's kind of a weird mixture of these two, and often it's characterized by dynamics that look like t e to the minus lambda T. These are called secular terms. Uh, secular kind of means like transient or um, you know not permanent. Uh, and so this secular or transient energy growth is a characteristic of these types uh, of, of solutions. These are really, really important in turbulence, in fluid dynamics, um, because you actually have systems that are actually stable for all time for all um, flow configurations, but you can still observe turbulence in those systems. So for example, flow past a pipe, like your garden hose or the pipes that lead to your house, um, pipe flow is linearly stable at all flow velocities, but clearly we've all seen when you turn on the tap uh, at some large flow velocity, if I, if I turn it on slowly, maybe I have a smooth laminar flow, but when I turn it on full blast, I get this kind of turbulent flow coming out. It looks all messy and disorganized and turbulent. And I'm gonna show you today in a few minutes that it's this transient energy growth that is what gives rise to that turbulence, that kind of uh, very nonlinear turbulent behavior, even for a system that's linearly stable. So I'm gonna come back to that example in fluid mechanics uh, in a little bit. But uh, for now, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna introduce what kind of an A matrix has this type of property, and I'm gonna show you an example in Python and MATLAB. Good. So specifically, the kinds of systems that have this behavior are what are called non-normal non-normal, I think this is a, an oddly progressive terminology uh, for a concept in math that's probably uh, quite old. So these non-normal systems. And normality is a property of this A matrix that literally means that um, if A transpose times A equals A, a transpose, then this would be a normal matrix. A would be called normal if this is true. And so a non-normal system has an A matrix where this is not true. Uh, 
And specifically, the more not true this is, the more different these two matrices are, the more non-normal your system is. So you can have very highly non-normal systems. And again, I'll give you some physical intuition for what non-normal means, um, for example, in fluid mechanics, and we'll be able to compute it um, in, in Python or in MATLAB. But I'm just defining there is this test that you can do to see if your matrix A is normal or not. And non-normal systems often have this transient energy growth. Or rather, this transient energy growth is particularly pronounced in very non-normal systems. So I'll give you an example. Um, one of the examples I like to give is what if my A matrix was equal to um, minus 0 0.009, we'll actually code this one up, minus 0 0.009, 0 minus 0 0.01, that's the diagonals, so these are going to be the eigenvalues, and I have a 1 off diagonal. Okay, so this, um, again, you can read the diagonals off of this system. Any system that has zeros below the diagonal or zeros above the diagonal, then the diagonal terms are going to be your eigenvalues. So we can read these off that lambda equals uh, minus 0.01, and lambda equals minus 0.009. So these are, in fact, this is, in fact, a stable system. It has stable eigenvalues. I would get, you know, e to the minus lambda t type behavior in this system. So it is stable. But because of this one up here, because of the, the, the structure of this matrix, its eigenvectors are going to be nearly parallel. Okay, so that is another kind of hallmark signature of these non-normal systems is that they're going to have nearly parallel eigenvectors. I'm going to have two eigenvectors from different eigenvalues that point almost perfectly in the same direction. Okay, so, so I'll, in a minute I'll actually compute out the eigenvectors. I'll convince you that they're nearly, uh, nearly parallel. But so these non-normal systems, the way I think about them is that they are almost degenerate. They are almost uh, degenerate meaning that they almost uh, are rank deficient. If those eigenvectors were perfectly, perfectly parallel, then the determinant of you know, A would be zero, and I would have a real issue, okay? So I'll, I'll come back to all of that in a minute. Um, I just want to convince you, yes, this A matrix does have stable eigenvalues, um, but I'm going to show you in Python and MATLAB that it has this transient energy growth and decay signature. Okay, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to fire up um, the computer. We're going to actually simulate the system, plot the trajectories. I'll show you that this is the behavior you get. Maybe we'll even compute how non-normal the system is. That could be, um, you know, interesting. And then I'm going to go back to paper and pencil and, you know, uh, write down the eigenvectors, show you that they're parallel, and then connect this back to fluid systems. So that's what I'm going to do in this lecture. Um, okay, good. So let's um, turn on... Uh, let's see. Okay, it looks like I'm starting in, uh, in Python here. And again, all of the codes are available in Python and in MATLAB, so you can just go to the website and download these. Um, and this one was written by Alan Kaptanoglu based on my MATLAB code. So again, we're going to you know, import some stuff. I think specifically we're going to be integrating um, the dynamics, so we're importing solve IBP from SciPy's integrate. Uh, and specifically here, what we're going to do is we are going to build this A matrix. It's exactly the one that I wrote down here. Uh, we're going to start with some initial condition, um, just, you know, 0, 1 in the x1, x2 coordinates. And we're going to integrate that system forward uh, on some time vector. Okay, so uh, we're defining some linear ODE, which is just uh, x dot equals A times x. I guess here it's y dot equals A times y. It doesn't matter what we call these variables um, in, in Python. And then we solve this initial value problem. Um, of that linear ODE on a certain time range, and we, we integrate the solution, and then we're going to plot the solution. Okay, so you should feel pretty comfortable with this by now. And this is the actual plot, the honest-to-goodness trajectory of the uh, x1 and x2 coordinates. I guess here they're called x and v. Um, and so the x1 and x2 coordinates, one of them at least, uh, the first state here, x, has this large transient energy growth before eventually it dies off and becomes actually stable. Okay, so this is just kind of visual proof that this does happen in these systems. You actually get this uh, large transient growth 
that looks unstable before it turns around and comes back to the origin. So this is a, gl a globally stable system, uh, but at least locally it doesn't look stable to start with. Okay, good. Um, you know, you can do the same thing in, uh, in MATLAB. I'm just showing you this here because I have it. Uh, same exact thing, create a time vector that we're going to integrate from time 0 to time 1,000 in increments of 0.1, build my A matrix, have my initial condition, uh, and integrate this system y dot equals A times y, and then plot the answer. So I'll just do that right now. And this is the answer. And again, you can see oof, that is way too small. Let's make my line widths um, much bigger. Let's make it three. It's simulating this thing. It's taking a little while. Yeah, that's much easier to read. And again, you see this, uh, this, this characteristic rise in the energy before it eventually dies out. Uh, to zero. So this is an honest to goodness stable system. It is stable. You compute the eigenvalues and you say to yourself, well, they're you know, negative real parts. Of course, I'm going to have a stable system e to the minus lambda t. Um, but for some reason, I get this weird transient energy growth here. Okay, um, and I'll point out that this system is when I when I say it's almost degenerate. What I mean by almost degenerate in this case is that if I breathed on the system, if I perturbed it a teeny tiny little bit, then these eigenvalues would exactly equal each other. I would get uh, lambda lambda one. Currently, these are distinct different eigenvalues with distinct different eigenvectors. But if I had exactly uh, this number equals minus 0.01, so if I changed it by just a little bit, so that they're equal, then I will get a completely different eigenstructure. Then my um, kind of I'll have a two-dimensional subspace for that eigenvalue lambda. I'll have two eigenvectors, um, and I'll show you how to compute those in, in the next lecture. But basically, that's what I mean, is that this thing is almost degenerate. If it was, you know, lambda 1, 0, lambda, so I had an actual repeated eigenvalue, that would be a degenerate system that would give me these, uh, these secular terms. So I'm going to show you how to derive these terms in the next lecture for an actually um, kind of degenerate system with repeated eigenvalues. This one is just approximately repeated eigenvalues. And uh, I guess I could compute the, um, the eigen decomposition, the eigs of A. And we find, again, that these eigenvalues are very, very close. And more importantly, my eigenvectors are nearly parallel. That was what I was showing you before. This eigenvector points in the, the 1, 0 direction. This eigenvector points in the, you can just multiply this by a minus sign, in the 1, minus 0.001 direction. So these are very, very, very nearly parallel eigenvectors. Um, they only differ by you know, 0.1%. So they're almost in the same direction, and that's a really big problem. That's what's going to give rise to this transient energy growth, as I'll show in a minute. Last thing I want to compute is, um, what is it, like A transpose times A and A times A transpose are very, very different. These you know, almost couldn't be more different, right? This one has a 0 in the upper left. This one has a 1 in the upper left. This one has a 1 in the lower right. This one has a 0 in the lower right. These are very, very different matrices. So this is a highly non-normal A matrix. OK, good. Um, so we've just plotted and demonstrated, yes, in fact, this matrix has this weird property. And now we're going to analyze further kind of why that's true. We're going to derive these terms, and we're going to connect it to some interesting properties in fluid mechanics. OK, so let me move this out of the way without throwing my laptop. Good. Um, <coughs> So, so we're analyzing this system. I've computed the eigenvalues. Let's just compute the eigenvectors really quickly. Um, you know, I'm going to write it down. You can, um, again, you're basically finding uh, a minus lambda i times what vector uh, x equals 0. OK, so for these lambdas, we're trying to find the x that maps to 0. And uh, we already showed that these, um, in my notes, I call them xis. So I'm going to call them xis here, just so I don't confuse you if you're following along at home. So let's say this is an eigenvector xi. And so the xis are uh, xi1 
equals um, I think I might have mixed up which one's which, but C1 equals 1 minus 0 0.001, and C2 equals 1, 0. So again, these are very, very nearly parallel uh, eigenvectors, okay? Uh, and so if I multiply a matrix, if I multiply my, my unit vectors, remember anytime I multiply um, vectors by a matrix, it usually rotates and stretches them. So what I can do is I can take my coordinate axis, um, let's say my, my, um, my, my, my coordinate axis, and I'm going to multiply, I'm going to take a unit vector in the x direction, a little unit vector in the x direction, and a little unit vector in the y direction, and I'm going to multiply them by this A matrix, and I'm going to see where they go, okay? Um, so I'm going to multiply this by A, and I'm going to draw some axes over here. We're actually going to try to plot these things. Um, so what is my unit vector times A? So my first unit vector uh, is like 1, 0. So if I multiply this by 1, 0, I get uh, minus a very, very small number. 1, 0. Okay, minus a very, very small number in the x direction, minus 0 0.009 in the x direction, and 0 in the y direction. So this vector maps to minus 0 0.0090, okay? So this little vector maps to a teeny tiny vector. And if I did this in, for a little unit vector in y, the 0, 1 vector, that would map. So if I multiply 0, 1 by this, I get 1 minus 0 0.01, 1 minus 0 0.01. So that's a big vector with a big, a big length. And so what we find is that this unit vector became teeny tiny. And this vector um, is almost parallel. It's actually pointing one in the x direction and a negative teeny, teeny bit in the y direction. I can't really draw it that accurately, but it looks like that. So they're nearly parallel, and this one's a lot longer than this one. And so technically, if I actually drew the little box here, you would find that this thing is, you know, this box here got massively sheared and stretched into this very, very thin rectangle here. Okay, and so that's what this A matrix is doing, is it's taking something that, you know, vectors that are perpendicular, and it's mapping them into very, very parallel, uh, parallel vectors. This is called shearing. This is a highly sheared uh, matrix, and it's a non-normal matrix. It's, it's uh, shearing this, um, this, unit, this unit box here. Okay, good. Um, so in the next lecture, what I'm going to do is I'm going to show you specifically how to solve e to the at when this is actually degenerate, when these eigenvalues are exactly equal, and we're going to derive these secular terms here. These, um, I'm literally going to call them secular, secular, is it secular or secular? Uh, secular terms, I don't know how to spell it, secular terms. This almost has like a religious connotation, right? Like the secular world is the transient world, not the uh, forever, you know, um, spiritual terms or whatever. So in the next lecture, I'm going to derive these secular terms for an A matrix with exactly repeated eigenvalues. So I'm going to show you how to compute e to the at for that matrix and convince you that these really are the terms. But what I'm showing you here is that even when the eigenvalues are not perfectly equal, they're just very, very close, and my eigenvectors are very, very parallel, I get terms that look a lot like this. And so now what I want to do is I want to give you uh, some examples in fluid dynamics. So uh, example, an example in fluids, which is there are lots of flows that have this basic property of non-normality. So any flow that is what's called shear dominated. Um, so a really good example of this is a boundary layer flow. So you can imagine the, the fluid flow over like a Boeing uh, wing, a, a you know, triple seven wing, is starts off being laminar, 
meaning um, you know the flow on the bottom is slower, the flow above it is a little faster, a little faster, a little faster until the free stream, you know, the really, really fast flow out here. But it's layered and it's kind of steady. It's not bumpy or moving. It's just kind of um, stably stratified, slower flow on the bottom, faster flow on top. Um, and so you can essentially see that the, the velocity profile, if I pick a point here, then the velocity here is slow, um, kind of slow and eventually increases to the steady state. So this is like the flow velocity at these points. Um, this is what we call a boundary layer profile. And at some point you start getting, you know, turbulence, which is really messy and um, erratic and you get a different profile. And so this is kind of approximately linear dynamics and this is very nonlinear. And so um, Let's draw another little vortex. Every, every happy vortex deserves a friend. Um, and so you get this transition to turbulence at some point in this boundary layer. Um, and what I would argue is that this system, the, the linearized dynamics, the linearized dynamics about this, um, this, this is called laminar over here. So we have laminar and turbulent. I would argue that if you, and, and there is a solution, there is mathematically a solution where the entire flow over the entire wing is in fact laminar, kind of stably stratified, but it is unstable at some flow velocity. At some position uh, on this wing, kind of turbulence gets excited, this instability gets excited, uh, and nonlinearities, you know, plus nonlinear terms start getting excited here uh, in the fluid flow equations. But there is a linear version of, of that, that solution uh, that has a laminar, a laminar solution. And so flows like this are what are called shear flows because you notice that the flow is slow and then faster and then faster. This kind of profile here where I have a linearly increasing flow velocity. So this is literally um, some X position here. This is some y position here, and this is my flow velocity u. When I have this large gradient of the flow velocity, a large partial u, partial y, when this is large, this is called a shear dominated flow. And shear dominated flows tend to have linearizations that are highly non-normal. Okay, that is a really important property in fluids. Flows, you can picture them, flows that have, uh, you know, really fast flows on top of really slow flows, they're going to want to kind of roil up and form this turbulence. This is called a shear dominated flow. And specifically, if I look at this little area patch here that I drew before, the fluid flow equations, the Navier-Stokes equations, um, at least you know, in, in liquid water or at low velocities in air, are incompressible, which means that the determinant of my A matrix is always going to have to equal 1 because fluid um, you know, can stretch, but it can't change its volume. Liquid can't change its volume. And so a little unit square with area 1 is going to have to map into another shape with area 1. But these shear flows, they tend to stretch out into these very kind of, can't, I hope I can draw it, these very kind of oblong, uh, very stretched, very sheared par parallelograms. So this still has area one, but this is highly sheared. This is a highly sheared volume. And literally this is what would happen if you took this cube, this square, and you put it in this flow, is that the top part is going to move faster than the bottom part and it's going to shear this square into this shape. Same thing with a boundary layer. If I put a little square here, a little imaginary square of particles, they're going to shear as they move forward. And those shear flows that have, again, very parallel eigenvectors of the A matrix are non-normal and they're going to give us this transient energy growth, this large increase in the energy or the state value of that system before it eventually dies off. And in some systems, uh, this is where it gets really interesting, you actually have some fluid systems where the A matrix, the linearization of the Navier-Stokes equation, are actually stable at all flow velocities. So I mentioned this before, your uh, pipe flow at home, 
you know, when you turn on the tap, so flow is going, let's make my flow blue, right? You got nice clean water hopefully coming in and out of this tap. This system is linearly stable at all flow velocities, so it'll only have stable eigenvalues. But what happens is that this is a highly sheared flow. The flow on the, near the walls is much slower than the flow in the middle. You, you literally have a flow profile that looks like, you know, like that. So it's much faster in the middle than on the outside. And that creates these large shears and makes the dynamics A highly non-normal. And so those systems specifically look like, uh, have, have responses that look like this, uh, this behavior. And specifically, if I have little roughness on my, the, the walls of my pipe, and pretty much all pipes have some amount of roughness on them, you know, maybe they're made of metal or concrete or whatever, even, even polished metal microscopically is going to have little elements of roughness. And these little elements of roughness give me an initial perturbation, an initial perturbation, and sometimes that perturbation can grow large enough to actually create and excite nonlinear terms in the Navier-Stokes equations. So these little li uh, linear perturbations can excite the system uh, and into full-blown turbulence. And so the picture I draw here uh, that I kind of like is that you have either you know, time or space on this axis. And we have kind of the intensity of a disturbance, literally the intensity uh, of a disturbance, like from this wall element here. And if it's a small enough disturbance and my flow is, sl is slow enough so the shear is not too bad, so the A is not so non-normal, then what I'm going to get is I'm actually going to have that disturbance increase and then eventually die out. It'll actually still be a laminar flow. So if you only turn your tap on you know, a quarter of the way or half of the way, maybe the flow is low enough and the shear is low enough that A is not so non-normal and this, this perturbation kind of dies out and decays. So you still have laminar flow out of your tap smooth kind of uh, flow. But at some point, if my disturbance is large enough, if it's a rough enough wall, or my flow velocity is large enough so the shear is really large, so my A matrix is highly non-normal, then essentially this will increase large enough, and instead of decaying down to zero, there is this threshold of instability, this kind of, uh, maybe I'll draw it here. This is an instability threshold, a transition threshold. This is called the transition threshold. Where above this, nonlinear dynamics in the Navier-Stokes equations, because the Navier-Stokes equations are not actually linear, we just linearize them about the laminar solution. At some point, these perturbations become big enough that my small angle approximation, my little delta perturbations or small approximation, no longer holds. These are big. And so they excite nonlinearities, and my system goes into self-sustained turbulence. So this is kind of self-sustained turbulence, self-sustained turbulence. And this is why the water coming out of your tap, if you turn up the tap really, really high volume, or if you have a really, really rough pipe, even though the equations are linearly stable at all flow velocities, at some magnitude of disturbance or at some flow velocity, these perturbations grow past a point where they excite nonlinearities and give you self-sustained turbulence. This is often called bypass transition to turbulence. So um, instead of having a nonlinear or an instability in A, uh, which is actually what happens here, this is an instability, uh, you can have an actually stable system, but through this non-normal uh, energy growth, these perturbation energies can grow larger and larger until they excite nonlinearities and get into self-sustained turbulence. So very, very cool stuff. Uh, and this has actually only relatively recently been understood, at least in the grand scheme of things, maybe in the last you know, handful of decades do we really kind of understand how this is happening. So that's kind of exciting. Uh, okay, is there anything else I want to tell you? Um, so these are very, very important systems actually where you have, and it's very common, if I just randomly draw an A matrix out of a hat, chances are this is not going to be true and it will be a non-normal A matrix and there will be at least some degree of non-normality and, and parallelness of my, of my eigenvectors. Um, at least in fluids, it has this very intuitive, interpretable, physical uh, interpretation of flows that have a lot of shear are going to have um, 
literally, you know, volumes in phase space are going to get sheared into these very o oblique um, uh, shapes, and that's going to give me this transient energy growth, which could excite nonlinearities and turbulence. Okay, uh, that was a lot. Um, one of my favorite topics in fluids, and in the next lecture, I'm going to show you mathematically what is the property of these parallel eigenvectors and these nearly equal eigenvalues that gets me close to what I'm calling degeneracy that gives me something that looks like these secular terms. So I'll tell you what these secular terms are in the next lecture, and we'll kind of understand more mathematically uh, how to take you know, e to the at of this matrix and why this is such a problem. All right, that's all coming up soon. Stay tuned. Thank you.